we're just excited to have them. And, and Brother Burks is, uh, is, uh, has become one of my best friends, I would say, and in ministry and even out of ministry. Uh, his son calls me Uncle Dan, and so our, our kids call them Uncle and Aunt. And so we, we just feel like we're that close with them and his father, amen, his brother, and his whole family. Uh, we just love them uh, so much. And uh, when I see him evangelizing, it takes me back to when I used to evangelize. And I, I, I remember those days. But when I see him broke down, I thank God that I'm pastoring today. Praise God. <laughs> I don't miss it at all. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. But uh, at this time, Brother Burks, come on up. I want you to preach to us. Take your liberty, brother. Hallelujah. Preach what the Holy Ghost gives you. Let's give a great hand clap of praise unto the Lord. He is truly worthy. Why don't you stand and love him for a moment? He is truly worthy of our praise. Why don't you lift your hands and just say, thank you, Jesus. Why don't you go ahead and lift your voice and just give him a shout of thanks. The Bible says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. And then enter into his courts with praise. Let's go ahead and do it right tonight. Let's give up some thanks in this place. Thank you, God, for your presence. Thank you, God, for the moving of your presence in this house. Hallelujah, Lord. You are so wonderful to us, God. Hallelujah. I echo everything that your pastor said, except that part about the breaking down stuff. I still there, but anyways, God is good, and uh, yes, your pastor, his family have become some of our best friends, and uh, it's absolutely amazing, the backstory of all that and everything, and the connection made, and I, I, I will tell you this, um, spending all the time that I have spent with him I even went with him to his doctor's appointment yesterday. I mean, this is my brother over here. And spending all the time that I have spent with him and his family, let me tell you something. I think you got a pretty good shepherd on your hands. I, I do. I, I think you've got a great pastor. Do you love your pastor? Do you love him? Amen. Give honor to my beautiful bride, my handsome little boy. Yeah, I see you, son. You're looking right. At, yeah, yeah, go ahead and smile, boy. Go ahead and smile. Give honor to them. Now, before I read my scripture text, I want to make one statement. If you are a visitor, you are looking for a church. I want to tell you, look no further. You need to make this man your pastor. And you need to make this place your home church. This is the place where God resides, and that's what I feel. I feel like every time I come into this place, whether you rent out this building or not, God is here because of the people that join here to worship on nights like tonight. God is in the midst of these people. And so if you are looking for a church, if you are visiting, I, I encourage you, make this man your pastor and make this congregation your church family. Joshua chapter 6, verse... Number 20. Joshua chapter 6, verse number 20. Then we will jump to 2 Samuel chapter 5. And I'll direct you to the verses when we reach that point. Joshua chapter 6, verse number 20. The Bible says, So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout. Everybody say a great shout. great shout. That the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him. And they took the city. Everybody say a great shout. Great shout. 2 Samuel chapter number 5. 2 Samuel chapter number 5. Let's, let's begin... With verse number 3, we'll read down through verse number 9. 2 Samuel chapter number 5, beginning with verse 3 says, So all of the elders came to the king to Hebron. 
And King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed king. They anointed David king over Israel. Verse number 4. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. In Jerusalem he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah. Watch this. In verse 6, And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites. Now, now, this place of Scripture, hear me, this place of Scripture, this moment in the biblical literature, David does not have Jerusalem yet. It is not his throne yet. The inhabitants of the land were the Jebusites, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither. Thinking David cannot come in hither. Now I want to read to you the same verse in the Holman's Christian Study Bible, as it says, The king and his men marched to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, who inhabited the land. The Jebusites had said to David, You will never get in here. Here, even the blind and the lame can repel you. Verse 7 of the King James. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, The blind and lame shall not come into the house. So David dwelt in the fort and called the city and called it the city of David, and David built round about from Milo inward. I want to stop there. David said, On that day, whosoever getteth up to the gutter. In one verse of scripture of Judges, or Joshua, I'm sorry, Joshua. Chapter number 6, we see one kind of victory. But here in 2 Samuel chapter number 5, we see an exact opposite, another kind of victory. So I want to preach to you upon this thought for a little while. Victory makes demand. When victory makes demands. Let's put our Bibles down. Let's lift our hands toward heaven. God, I want you to prepare our hearts for the word. God, you liken your word unto a seed that should be planted in fertile ground. So, Lord, I'm asking tonight that the hearts, minds, and lives of the individuals that are standing before me, that are standing with me in your house, God, that they would be fertile hearts, they would be fertile minds, and that God, they would be ready to accept the word that you would have preached this evening. Let them be great recipients of what you would have to convey to us. Lord, we praise you and give you glory. We will be forever careful to worship you. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and everybody said amen. If you're going to help me preach tonight, you can be seated. It's without controversy. Everybody likes to win. Brother Jimmy was in here at this moment. He would understand I'm a very bad, sore loser. He kind of beat the socks off of me in horseshoes the other day after I had said he wasn't going to do that. He did it anyways. Everybody loves to win. Everybody loves this word called victory. Am I right? Everybody wants to be victorious. Everybody dreams of being victorious in one way or another. But not everybody is willing to go through the necessary obstacles that stand in the way of obtaining that victory. Simply put, everybody wants to win, but not everybody wants to work to win. The truth of this is seen in the terrible epidemic that is running through our nation. And in turn, it has affected our churches. There is a contagious mentality controlling countless millions of people in this America. It is the mentality of 
the infirmed, that brainwashing way of thinking that encourages you to take the route out of all your cannots. I have read where surveys have shown that it has never been easier to make the claim of being incapable, helpless, infirm, out of action, out of commission than it is today. You have never had so much support as you do now to declare yourself handicapped in some way. I am not talking of the cases of the truly physically disabled, but I am talking to those of you here this evening who believe the lie that you are too inferior to be triumphant. To those individuals who think you are not capable of obtaining victory over the circumstances that stand in your world, I come to preach to you a little message that yes, you are capable of having victory in your life. Hear me, though you may have faults, yes we do, and though you may be looking at yourself as having nothing to offer because of all that you might find bad and all that you might find wrong with you, I must preach to you this evening that you have to remember that God still sees enough right with who you are. His ways are still above your ways. He might, You might be looking at a mountain, but God said, I see a mere molehill, and as a a matter of fact, he said with just a little bit of faith, you can speak to that mountain. Be thou removed and cast into the sea. You might see a valley before you that stretches out too great, but God looks and says, oh no, I see an open plain of opportunity for me to show my glory. I want to preach to somebody here. In our weakness, God is still made strong. You might have incapabilities, but it doesn't make him any any less God. You might have troubles, but it doesn't make him any less God. He's still able to do exceedingly abundantly above all. You might have weariness right now, but it doesn't make him any less God. You might be in pain, but that doesn't make him any less God. Thank you, Brother Bob. I, I, I love your worship. I told him today whenever he came in, he, there's just something about this man that whenever he walks into the house of the Lord, I, I, I just feel good whenever this man walks in. And I, I believe that's the way it should be. We, we need people who can stand up and say, I've been through way too many valleys to doubt him now. I've crossed too many mountaintops to doubt him now. We need some individuals in this place who can rise up and worship as example to let individuals know throughout this city hey I still believe in a God who can do anything you see, no matter my abilities, he's still high and lifted up. No matter my delinquencies, his compassions just simply don't fail. No matter my defects, he's still the great I am. He's still the blessed redeemer. He's still the strong tower. He's still the help in time of trouble. He's still powerful. He's still almighty. He's still righteous. He's still holy. No matter what I'm going through, he changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. No matter all of the troubles and pains in my world of presence, he is still the God who can take away it all. You might have troubles in your world right now, but my God is the one who troubles the troublemaker. I want to let somebody know my God is incredibly good. He can turn a street walker into a tongue talker. My God can turn a chain smoker into a conference preacher. He can take the drug addict and make him the best altar worker. He can take the rebel and make him righteous. He can take the former prison individual and make them the greatest example of his glory and of his power. Yes, some of you need to be reminded in this place of what Paul said of 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 28. He said, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised. But God had chosen them, yea, and things which are not to bring to not things that are. He simply 
Wesley was trying to tell us he can take the broken and make them whole. He's beyond exceptional at taking the least and making them the greatest. He's excellent at taking the humble and giving them authority. He is outstanding at showing the sinner that he's a faithful savior. My God can turn commotion into great promotion. It is the trick of the enemy to try and confuse you about God's ability. Remember, though, we serve an awesome God. We still have an enemy out there. The devil, a roaring lion seeking, going about seeking in search of, looking for those he may devour. The devil will stop at nothing to make sure that you rot in a lake of fire. He is the master deceiver. He is the king of propaganda. He does not care if you worship while you're here as long as you curse while you're not. He does not care if you shout as long as you never let go of your burdens. It does not bother him if you speak in tongues at the altar as long as you're bound to bitterness and hatred when you leave. He doesn't care if you look right in here as long as you don't live it out there. He doesn't mind if you cry your heart out to God as long as you leave here shackled with fear. I want to preach to some people for a moment. This might get a little tough. You may not like me when I'm done with you here in the next two minutes. I want to tell some people you cannot fake your way through a breakthrough. You cannot fake your way through a shout. You better not fake your way through worship. Why is it? Because why everybody else is in the place thinking you're getting a good breakthrough and yet you're doing nothing but pretending you're making God a liar by the affiliation of the church and your worship. Oh, I come to tell somebody your performance better be authentic. Your performance better be good. You better come in needing a breakthrough because if you come in and fake your way through it, you turn God into a liar. But I rise to tell you, my God desires to show you his caring nature this evening. He wants to have wants you to have victory right now over your confusion of your mind. If you're looking for the key to winning today, I don't preach to you some kind of wordy message. I don't want to elaborate off of what Webster's Dictionary could have given me to put into this message this evening. No, but I come to tell you, if you want true victory, it's already in this place. The Bible says that Jesus looked at a woman in John chapter 4 and 26 and said the one that you've been looking for look no further because I am he he said in John chapter 5 verse 43 I come in my father's name and his name is Jesus John 6 and 35 he said I'm the bread of life John 8 and 12 I'm the light of the world John 8 and 18 I'm my own witness I'm so good I don't need anybody else to see me do it John 8 and 23 I'm from above I'm not from below John John 10 and 9, I'm the door. John 10 and 10, I come to give you life. John 10 and 11, I'm the good shepherd. John 11, 25, I'm resurrection and I'm life. John 13 and 13, I'm your master and I am your Lord. John 14 and 6, I'm the way and I'm the truth and I'm the life. I want to tell you, if you come in seeking victory, look no further than who Jesus is. Well, somebody ought to clap your hands because if it had not been for Jesus, you would still be a pothead. Somebody ought to clap your hands because if it had not been for Jesus, the voodoo doctor would have got you. If it had not been for Jesus, you'd still be in a prison cell. If it had not been for Jesus, you'd still be addicted, disgusted, broken, abused. If it had not been for him... Throughout the Gospels, tells us, I'm your hope, I'm your peace, I'm your joy, I'm your rest, I'm your comfort, I'm your burden bearer, I'm your caretaker, I'm the true vine, 
I'm the husbandman. I am, I am, and I am. He goes throughout Scripture and explains to us as best as he can. And it is still he who gives you your victories even today. It is he who orchestrates your comings and your goings even today. But yet the question is poised in your mind standing there stagnant because it has faced you every morning and it has glared at you every evening as you begin to wonder and you're ready to scream to the whole world. But what about the chaos that I'm going through right now? If he is all of this, if he is everything that you have spoken him to be, what about what I'm going through now? I've got an answer for you if you're willing to take it this evening. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now you need to understand that whenever we read this verse of how he has these thoughts that he thinks towards us, thoughts of peace and thoughts of good things, thoughts of an expected end that he wants us to arrive at, I began to look into this scripture and I wanted to understand it more. And as we do, Pastor Langford, we will go to other translations many times to see what they would have to say and Jeremiah 29 verse 11 of the New International Version says for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not harm you plans to give you hope and to give you a future some of you need to understand here tonight that thoughts and plans you want to know why you might be going through what you're going through it's a simple answer Sometimes plans happen to change. Sometimes plans take another route. Sometimes plans take another road. But Brother Bob, the great thing about this is though plans may change and thoughts may change, the expected end that God wants to bring you to does not alter. The expected end that God wants to bring you to remains the same. The expected end, what end is that? It's an end of no harm. It's an end of hope. It's an end with the future. It's an end with prosperity. God wants somebody to know plans may change, but what I'm bringing you to will not change. There's an incredible man of God named Brother Bobby Wade out of Sealsby, Texas. Know him very well. Every time we run into him at camp meeting or services, whatever, he just comes over and he lays hands on me and my wife and just prays. But there was a time, almost exactly a year ago, Bobby Wade showed up at a camp helping coordinate this camp. He shows up and he looks at me. and I'm sitting there with my bride and He looks at me and he says, you need to get your eyes off of what you're going through. And you need to get your eyes off on what God is leading you to. And I lived the scripture of just many times plans change. But I do not take hope in the changing. I take hope in the expected end that is concrete for me. Because there is a true will of God for my life that he wants to bring me to. Some of you need to get your eyes off of what's going on around you. Because that's just plans that you're going through. Because whenever you build a building and a blueprint is laid out, it does not always go accordingly to the blueprint. But sometimes a four-week promise turns into a six-week project because along the way something happened. There was too many storms. There was too many wrecks. There was too many accidents. There was too many faulty pieces of equipment that went in to building this framework. And all of a sudden at the end of it, you realize I'm so thankful that I took the two weeks extra into this project. 
project because now I know the expected end of what was going on was never going to change. But every now and then, I have to allow the plans to alter for my good. I have to allow the plans to alter for my success. I have to allow the plans to alter for my prosperity. And I have to allow the plans to alter so that I can have the future. So he said the end is still expected. It doesn't change. And it will always be the end that holds, encapsulates your victories. Because you'll think you're failing while you're going through the thoughts. And you'll think you're losing while you're going through the plans. But understand the victory is still in the end capsule. I want to preach about victory for just a moment. Got this real close friend of mine, Brother Chase Combs, his pastor, Brother Joshua Cathy. Pastor's there in the Houston area, Caney Creek. And he recently, or, or, or really about a, a bit, about a year ago coming up, he ran a charitable 5K race. And he told me that before the race began, he went up to one of the attendants standing at the starting line, which also happened to be the finish line. And being the preacher that he is, he set this lady up with a question. Now understand, this, this guy's in pretty good shape. He's pretty incredible shape. He's lost nearly 100 pounds, and, and so he's, he's doing better than he's ever done. In great shape, runs every day. For pastor appreciation, last year they bought him this, this long sleeve dry fit shirt that said, The Running Preacher. He just runs all the time in great shape. But being the preacher that he is, he went up to this lady at the line, and he poised a question to her. He said, ma'am, what if I can't run the whole way? What if I have to stop and walk and I get down to the finish line and, and I have to walk across, I can't run across. Understand that this is a man who has run marathons. This is a man who gets out and runs a 5K on a daily basis. He poses this question under her expecting a particular kind of answer. And the answer that she gave was exactly what he was counting on. As she looked at him and says, Honey, it does not matter if you run across, walk across, or crawl across. It is still a win. Lifelong runner and Austin Marathon race director John Conley has been part of many races. None of the finishes he's ever been a part of quite compared to what he saw on a Sunday evening in Austin, Texas in 2015. What we saw was a champion, he said, the toughest person on the planet. Conley's not talking about Cynthia Jarrett, the women's winner, who finished that 26.2 mile race in a great amount of time ahead of everybody else. No, he expected to see the Kenyan runner, Miss Yvonne. According to reports he had received from the race course, she had been leading most of the race. But with just two tenths of a mile left to run, Miss Yvonne began to wobble and stagger, and then she fell. She attempted to get back up and keep running, but was very unsuccessful. But the article says that Miss Yvonne never stopped moving with members of the race team's medical staff walking on all sides, cheering her on. Miss Yvonne crawled her way to the finish line. Conley stated Miss Yvonne crawled more than 400 meters, over 1,312 feet to cross that line that day, leaving her knees and elbows bloodied and her hands stained by the pavement. She was immediately rushed to a medical center where she received care. Later that evening, John Conley came up to her and he stated these words. He said, Miss Yvonne, you ran a brave race, but you crawled the bravest crawl that I have ever seen in my life. I want to preach to a church. I've come to tell you, you're not always going to finish the way that you want to finish, but it's still a finish. Nonetheless, being victorious will not always come in a pretty package but it's victory nonetheless my God 
I submit to us tonight, uh, victory will make some demands. Uh, you want victory in your life. Uh, are you willing to meet victory's appeals? Uh, sometimes victory uh, will demand that you journey to the wit's end uh, and then a little further. Uh, I rise to tell you, uh, victory will demand difference in distinction. Uh, victory will ask you to go against the grain. Uh, victory will ask you to take routes uh, that are not normal. Uh, the desire of victory uh, will lead you down avenues that are not popular down streets nobody is willing to trod more times than not victory will bring you face to face with failure and say you better conquer it sometimes victory will draw up your biggest fears and your worst nightmares but you hear me tonight it would not be victory if it did not demand this Some of you need victory in this place because I felt it in the Holy Ghost. As some were getting a breakthrough, you were way too casual and watching them get a breakthrough and you were way too satisfied sitting on that pew while everybody else was getting a Miss Yvonne victory. Oh, you saw some run in the aisles. They only did that physically because I felt it in the Holy Ghost. They didn't come in running. They came in crawling. But in their crawl, God's given them victory. Victory. Since when was it okay for it to just be participation in attendance at the house of the Lord? In the Old Testament, God required some things. And he said, if you could not meet the requirement, don't even bring your sacrifice to the house of God until you meet the requirement. Victory has got some requirements of some of you here this evening. You want victory in your life? Oh my God, why do I feel what I feel? Some of you are struggling with dope right now and your pastor don't even know that you've distanced yourself from him because of the things you're afraid that God will tell him in discernment. I feel the Holy Ghost. Some of you are still messing with pornography and I'm not just talking to men. I'm talking to women. I feel the presence of Almighty God standing beside me right now while I preach to some of you. I'm going to find you out here in a minute because I come to preach a message of strength that God wants you to have victory this very don't you dare sit there with your arms crossed in the spiritual and in the physical saying God I don't need that I've been coming to church for so much I've been coming I've been faithful in my giving I've been faithful in my participation and in my support to this man of God but I come to tell you you might have been faithful in just a few things but you are not victorious over many Victory will demand your best at your lowest of lows so that you can experience the best at the highest of highs. If you hear me, please, somebody, victory will give you cause to shout. Sometimes you'll dance for victory. Brother Xavier, I told you as you walked past me and you said, I haven't ran like this in a few years. And I stopped you and I told you, that every time victory calls for a run, you better run because sometimes victory might come with something else besides a run. But whenever you can run to it, you better run because if you're not running, you might find yourself flat on your face in a desperate crawl to victory. Victories do not always come like Jericho, but they're a victory nonetheless. Sometimes you're going to leap for joy and sometimes you're going to make a lap and sometimes you're going to have an old-fashioned victory march around this place. But hear me, there will be times that victory does not come in that variety, but victory will demand that you crawl to the place that God has for you. 
Oh no, some of you cut me off a little while ago whenever I pinpointed your spirit. You hear me? Sometimes you're going to have to crawl to a place of prayer. Sometimes you're going to have to crawl your way to answers. Sometimes you're going to have to crawl your way into personal revival. Sometimes you're going to have to crawl your way to a greater walk with God. I would love to tell this congregation you'll always come in with the pep in your step, but the truth is some days you're going to have to get down on your hands and knees and say, God, if I'm going to make it, it's because I crawled my way to this place. God, if I'm going to survive, it's because I crawled my way through the muck and through the mire. If I'm going to make it, it's because I got a little low. But there's a revelation, my God, in getting low. The revelation is that you realize he's not any less God on the bottom than he is on the top. He's not any less God in the valley than he is on the mountain. He's just as much God when you're on your face as he is God when you're running those aisles. He is just as much God whenever you're being depressed as he is God whenever you've got joy unspeakable and full of glory. He's not any less God when you're on your knees than he is when you're standing up tall. Somebody ought to lift your hands right now. I'm going to go on, but somebody ought to lift your hands. And you better thank God he did not leave you at the crawl. No, lift your hands. Oh, you're not, I, I, I ain't even looking at the crowd, but I feel in my spirit there is a rejection spirit in this place. I hope I'm not being recorded. If I am, I'm so sorry. But there is a rejection spirit in this place that says I will not move because you're preaching to my situation and yet that's whenever you should move the most is whenever God pinpoints who you are and says I want to change what's going on. I want to change what you're going through. Some of you came in crawling and you've been bitter because you're down. Some of you came in crawling and you're so mad because you're down. Some of you came in crawling and you're so confused and you're so upset. And yet God simply wants to tell you I'm not any less God on your knees than I am when you're standing up shouting. I've got to preach to you. If you have to crawl, the devil isn't any less defeated. Oh, Lord. If you've got to crawl, the enemy's camp isn't any less destroyed. If you've got to crawl, Satan's agenda is still ruined. If you've got to crawl, the enemy's efforts are still in vain. If you've got to crawl across the line, it's still a win nonetheless. You cannot allow discouragement to override the process of victory. Victory will demand that you stretch. Victory will stretch you. It will expand. Oh, hear me. Let's get down to where the rubber meets the road. You ready? Victory will expand your convictions. Victory will expand your foundations. Victory will greatly amplify your reason to stand when nobody else will stand. But in the case of obtaining victory, we'll see how far you're willing to reach. Victory will challenge the length you're willing to go to obtain it. Victory will stretch you beyond your now. It will stretch you into a future. 
hear me Paul went through perils as I preached the other night perils that you and I would be greatly disturbed to even experience a small fraction of but he still comes back to us in 1 Corinthians 9 and 26 and he said I therefore so run not as uncertainly so fight I not as one that beateth the air but he was trying to get a point across that says I'm not doing this for nothing. I am not going after victory for nothing. There is a prize at the end of the battle. There is, oh my God, there is a crown at the end of the fight. There is a reward at the end of the struggle. I do not do this for nothing, but I must be victorious at any cost there is a reward there is a crown there is a gift I'm coming to a close right now I promise my God but the Valdez there are a few victories in scripture I have my favorites, I guess we could say. I love David and Goliath. I love Jacob and the angel. I love Haman and Mordecai. I love all of the victories of old. David and all of the things he fought through. As Hebrews Chapter 11 says that there was men who wrought righteousness and brought down kingdoms. There was victories. The account of the victory over Jericho. Brother Rodriguez, it's, it's a very good story. I'm not trying to taint or degrade the victory of Jericho. But there are a few things that I believe you and I must understand about Jericho victories. I must be very honest and tell you that not all victories come like Jericho. Not all victories come with a war cry and a victory march. Sometimes they come in the form of a Jebus. Sometimes you're going to be like David and his raggly little army coming up against those who look at you and declare you to be so pitiful that individuals with handicaps worse than yours can defeat you. Jebus, he was the one who was the father of the Jebusites. He was the one whose lineage now inha inhabited the land known as Jerusalem. Remember, though, it might not be a ground-shaking victory like Jericho. Sometimes you just need to rejoice in the victory anyways. 2 Samuel chapter 5, David looks at the city inhabited by a people of Jebus. Before it became the city of David, he hears the taunts of his enemies. He turns to his men, and this is what he says. Anybody who is willing to go through the gutters to fight this foe will be a chief and be a captain. He said, anybody who is willing to go through the sewage drains and the waterways of this city to fight the enemy, they will be rewarded by position and prominence. So can I tell you what happened? Brother Valdez, these men literally crawled their way to a victory. They crawled through the gutters to overtake a city. No, it didn't happen like Jericho because not all victories come in that variety. Hear me for a few moments more. At Jericho, victory came from above, but at Jebus, it came from beneath. 
at Jericho, victory began with a shout. But at Jebus, it started with a shimmy. At Jericho, they stood strong. But at Jebus, they had to lay prostrate. At Jericho, they broke pitchers. But at Jebus, they broke through sewers. At Jericho, victory came with a great shaking. But at Jebus, it came with a terrible stench. At Jericho, they blew trumpets. But at Jebus, they had to hold their breath many times. Jericho fell with hands that were held high. But Jebus fell to those that were on their knees. Jericho fell with the march and with the run, but Jebus fell to those who were just willing to crawl. You see, sometimes you're going to run to victory. Sometimes you're going to leap. And yes, sometimes you're going to walk. But tonight, if you came in crawling, you're closer to your victory than you've ever been before. Tonight, if you came in with a crawl, it is still a victory at the end of the finish line. You see tonight, you might have wounds when you cross that finish line. You might feel weary. You might feel beat up. But you need to remember it's still a victory nonetheless. If you feel like you barely made it, it's still a victory if you barely made it. Sometimes you might have to pull yourself out of the lies and the rubble, but it's still a victory at the end of it all. I want to bring you to a scripture real quick and then I promise give me two more minutes and I'm going to close this thing out the Bible says rejoice not against me O my enemy when I fall I shall arise you need to understand that the man who wrote that very scripture Micah also wrote just a chapter before that the enemy I'm facing is the brother of my own home. And there are individuals here, you have people in your world you need to exile because you have people in your world who are all about watching you fall and stay down. The enemy of my world is my own brother, he said. And so I, I know the scripture says we are not supposed to add to or take away from the Bible. But I wonder if I could interest you into a little concept that whenever the Bible says rejoice not against me, O my enemies, when I fall I shall arise. I want to let the enemy know. I want to let the devil know from the depth of my heart. When I go down, I'm going to get back up, but I will not get back up in the same place I went down. devil you thought you had me and you, you, you came along coming through the bushes looking for my carcass where I went down but I, I have to inform you tonight enemy I have to inform you tonight enemy that where I went down you will not find me because when I go down I may not be able to get back to my feet but I'm going to get to my knees and I'm going to get to my I'm going to get to my elbows and I'm going to get to my hands and I'm going to crawl. You better not rejoice now, enemy, because you're in more danger when I go down than you, you, than you are when I'm standing up and you've got your eye on me because when you can't see me in the bush, I'm crawling my way to victory. I'm going to obtain victory if it takes a crawl. Stand with me right now. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I told you that there were some things we needed to understand about the victory at Jericho. I understand how long I've been preaching. Please forgive me. I promise I'm closing right now. The greatest difference between the victory of Jericho and the victory of Jebus is one... You have to give everything back. But the other, you get to keep it all. The Lord instructed the children of Israel not to take anything that belonged to the city of Jericho. But in Joshua chapter 7, there comes upon a man by the name of Achan who took 
as the Bible says, of the accursed thing. And God killed him and God killed his family. And Joshua says in chapter 6, verse 26, Cursed is the man that rebuilds the city of Jericho. You even see Jesus in the book of Mark. He enters Jericho and then he leaves Jericho. And the only individual he touched was on the outside of the city, a man by the name of Bartimaeus, blind beggar. Because you see, after Jericho goes down, you don't get to keep it. My God. You, 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 you don't get to build a house on Jericho anymore. Some of you have been surviving off Jericho victories with your march and with your run and with your hand waves. But can I tell you the reason you are still depressed whenever you leave the house of God believing a Jericho victory has come along is because you need to know you do not get to keep the spoil of Jericho. You have to give it back. But when you crawl for a Jebus victory, you get to keep everything even the things you did not fight for now belong to you. The Bible never calls this place the city of Jebus. The Bible calls it by what David named it, called it Jericho. Because Jebus victories give you entire kingdoms that you did not plow, kingdoms you did not build. You can't build anything after Jericho, but you get to live in cities you did not erect. You get to live in homes you did not build. You get to eat from vineyards you did not plant. You get to drink from wells you did not dig. You get to drink, you get to eat of the cattle that did not belong to you in the beginning of the battle. Whenever you have a Jebus victory. God gives you more than what you thought you were fighting for. See, after Jericho, they still lived in tents and they still traveled through a wilderness. Brother Chris, you know what they did after a Jebus? After Jebus, they crowned a king. Because after Jericho, you have a funeral. And you have to bury part of the victory. My God, somebody hear me, please. But after Jebus, you get to have a coronation. You may have come in crawling tonight. You may have come in tonight not understanding. You may have come in tonight in total confusion. You need to hear me. Victory does not care what it looks like. It may not look like a parade or a Broadway show, but victory doesn't care about its stage presence. It's still a victory with the sound of the trumpet or it's a victory with the crawl of the gutter. Every head bowed right now in the name of Jesus. During the coronation, it, it doesn't say this, but I wonder, Pastor Langford, I wonder what victory really looked like. I wonder if Joab looked at the men that were behind him. I wonder if some of them elders looked at some of those men behind him and said, Man, victory sure feels good, especially after what we just had to crawl through. Oh, victory sure feels good, especially since you still smell like you came out of a sewer gutter. Oh, the triumph of victory was made that much more because they looked at each other and said, man, you got stuff hanging off of your armor. Your sword is still bloody. 
Your shield is still bent and battered. Your spear has been broken. The back of you is still carrying things that you got that crawled all over you, that splashed all over you when you went through the gutter. Can I tell you this? Sometimes victory will not always look the way you want it to look, but it makes victory that much more triumphant to know I am celebrating after what I just came through. Right now, I open up this place for this presence of the Lord to begin to minister to somebody. You've had prophetic words spoke over you, and let me tell you, when prophecy comes, so does a gutter. When prophecy comes, so does a crawl. But many times you've got to have a crawl in order for you to have a crown. I want you to reach over and I want you to begin to pray for your neighbor right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, reach over. Now's not the time for an awkward moment in the presence of the Lord. Now's not that time. You're hearing a young man preach to you who's crawled way too much. You're hearing a young man preach to you who's had to make his family crawl. We've been mad at the call of God on our life many times. We've been upset with what God has called us to because it just seems that the greatest victories always require something in advance. You want victory in your world. You want victory over the city of Las Vegas. Can I tell you what needs to happen tonight is there is a spirit of David that has rose up in your pastor's heart that is crying out saying, whosoever getteth up to the gutters to take this foe, whosoever is willing to crawl through the lowest places to find the individuals, whosoever who is willing to go to the sewer drains, whosoever is willing to go to the abased, whosoever is willing to go to the foolish, whosoever is willing to go to the weak, whosoever is willing to get them up through the gutter is going to get position and is going to get prominence. They are going to receive blessings from on high. Why? Because you are willing to go through things you did not have to go through. This city has looked at this church Oh, I feel this in the Holy Ghost, my God. This city has looked at this church and said, even the blind and the lame can repel you. But the blessing of God, the word of God, the position of God has come along and said, whosoever is willing to go through the gutters to reach the city, they, they're gonna be the one they're going to be the one. Are you willing to go through the gutter to get it? Are you willing to crawl through the nasty to get it? Are you willing to go through the abased things? Are you willing to go through the low to get to the high? The Bible says that Jesus looked at his disciples and says, the least will be the greatest. The least will be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Oh, sometimes the least requires a crawl because victory makes demands. Oh, right now in the name of Jesus. It's understanding that somebody's getting right now. You're finally understanding why you're crawling. You're finally understanding why you feel like you're barely making it. You're finally understanding why you felt like quitting. But for some reason, you were not going to give the enemy that kind of victory. You are not going to give the enemy that kind of triumph. You are not going to give the enemy that kind of reward. And so you begin to crawl. You are here moving in a mist. I worship you. Dad, 
Your family cannot be victorious without you. You're here in the house of the Lord and you've somewhat turned me off already. But I come to tell you, you cannot have a victorious family unless you first show them you're willing to go through the gutter first. Don't you dare make that family go through the gutter and you stand back in a vineyard believing that you're fine. No, don't you dare make that family have to break through a sewage drain just to get victory. They cannot be victorious on their own. Dad, it's time for you to get down on your knees and on your hands and it's time that you begin to crawl again. 